Um, I just want to say, as your pastor, I'm so unbelievably blessed. Um, I know next Sunday is Pastor Appreciation, and the Sunday after that is the one-year anniversary of when you all voted to bring us here. So, gosh, we're almost at our anniversary together, which is wild. Um, But, you know, over the last couple of weeks, you guys have just poured out in unbelievable ways. Um, You know, last week we had Teen Challenge with us. And to see a ministry like Teen Challenge and what they do, to hear the testimonies of young men who've come through addiction and struggle and into freedom was tremendous. And, um, you know, we did an offering at the end, and Bethel was able to bless them with almost 1,300 um, in last week. So thank you. That was phenomenal. So please put your hands together for that. Parallel to that, with everything going on in Western North Carolina, you guys brought in a tremendous amount of supplies um, for us to take. And so we actually put together a couple of videos. We strung them into one thanks to Michael's tech wizardry. Uh, But if we can, can we show uh, the video? It's about a minute long. Uh, This was us loading all of the stuff between the three churches. Uh, That was a 5 by 10 trailer and the bed of a truck. Uh, there between us, Renew, and Cole Mill Road Church of Christ. We absolutely filled that to the brim. Um, I'm just going to be honest, Michael and Larry didn't believe, but I had faith that we would get it all in there. (laughs) And these are the planes. You know, these are privately owned uh, planes that the owners were paying for all of the fuel to get all of these supplies that you see here flown to Western North Carolina. You know, and I think a lot of times uh, people, you know, speak negatively or look down on the wealthy, but I think the ability that the Lord has blessed someone to have a private plane by which they're willing to pilot and pay for the fuel to get all of these supplies to families in need is tremendous. And so we were able to bring in a portion of that and help uh, to get all of that out uh, to those in need. And so uh, thank you. You brought stuff. There's still stuff that has continued to come in, and you can continue to bring stuff in. Uh, We're working with some other ministries now more locally where stuff's being loaded on semis uh, to be taken because there are still a lot of people in need. You know, if you follow the news at all, you know there's still 200 people unaccounted for um, in that part of our state, and that is an unbelievable amount of people. And so we want to continue to pour out uh, what the Lord has blessed us with. Also, you know, I've been in touch with a couple of different ministries that are out there looking for the right time for us to take people. Um, Because right now, a lot of people are going. But even from last week to this week, there's already almost a 30% drop in volunteers. So over the next couple of weeks, that number is just going to continue to go down, and the level of need is still going to be unbelievably strong. And so I want to be able to take people in and help when it seems like things have quieted down and a lot of other people from far away aren't able to come in and help because they've already used up their time. Um, but it's, it's a tremendous area of need. And so please be praying for them in the western part of North Carolina, for the Florida. I, I mean, for everything that's going on, there's still storms brewing you know, out in the Gulf. Like it might not be over yet this year, but with the power of prayer, we can see those things dissipated and see all of that quieted down. And these are the moments I love to see the church rise up. Like watching an interview uh, with Franklin Graham, you know, when they were asking him his thoughts, you know, on the situation with FEMA and all this kind of stuff, I I just loved that Franklin Graham said, well, I don't think it should be the government's responsibility to care for people. I think that's the church. And I was like, I, I loved to hear him say that because I do believe that the Lord has called the church to care for widows and orphans and those in need. And the church is the ones that should show itself strong. And so thank you uh, for doing that for Western North Carolina. Also, uh, in just a second, don't put it up yet, Kristen, but in just a second, they're going to put a picture up. Um, You know, when the school year restarted this year, uh, the Lord really started speaking to me about being a blessing to our public schools here in the area. And I really started asking the Lord, like, how do you want us to do that? And the Lord opened up a couple of opportunities. One I'm going to talk about in just a minute, but the other one, as I was praying, I felt uh, like the Lord, like, really spoke to me about a particular class in a particular elementary school in our public school system here. 
and I saw that there was a first grade teacher, and I have a first grader, um, so my heart is slightly partial to first grade. Um, and, and there's something that I've done with our girls, uh, I mean, since Finley was tiny, I do bedtime pretty much every night in our home. And as a part of bedtime, I read to both of our girls every night. It's just something that's a part of our bedtime routine. Uh, with Quinn, we go to the library and we get like 15 to 20 books a week and I do like two or three every night. Then we go and change them with Finley. You know, she gets the bigger ones and so like it'll take us a week or two to read one book like we've been reading through the Chronicles of Narnia together. Um, but with Quinn, like I love like that time, you know, of her like learning and growing as we're reading together. And when I found out about this elementary school um, over on the northeast side of our city, I reached out to one of the teachers there, Miss Havity. I felt like the Lord just led me to her in particular. And didn't know why at the time the Lord led me to her, but I felt like very much it was what the Holy Spirit was doing. And I reached out to her and I said, you know, you're a Durham public school teacher, what's it like, how's it going? She responded back to me and said, it's not easy, there's a lot of lack. And so I said, you know, would you mind just taking a few minutes to talk with me on the phone? And after she finished uh, prepping, she called and I said, what's your area of need? Like, what, you know, you talk about there's need, what's the area of need? Um, she, she said, well, one example is in our first grade classroom, the kids don't actually have any physical books to read. She's like, everything they have in our classroom is printed off on a Xerox machine and handed out to them as we go through the day. And I said, you don't have any books. And she goes, no, we have no books in our classroom. And I was like, man, Lord, what would it be like for Quinn if she didn't have books, you know? And so I got together with Michael and Teresa, and I said, I would really love to help. And they were like, yeah, it sounds amazing. And so can you put the picture up? This is their classroom. Uh, as a church, Bethel, we went and bought them books for their classroom. I just felt like it was the right thing to do. But you know what's so amazing is I love the Lord and the way, if you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, the way he connects you with people. Miss Havity, their teacher, there, when I got there and brought them the books, uh, the kids were like going through them like, wow, like flipping through it, you know, like it was so cute. And as I was talking with her, she was like, why did your church do this? And I was like, we just felt like we wanted to be a blessing um, into our schools. And I said, I felt in particular like the Lord wanted me to bless you. And she goes, it's just so awesome. She's like, to think that the Lord is thinking about me. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, the Lord really loves you. And she goes, well, you know, I, I know that the Lord loves me. She's like, but I, I just, she's like, the way he like returns things back to you. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, this year I had some money that I was considering using for the classroom. And she goes, instead, after everything happened in Israel, I felt like the Lord asked me to volunteer my time because after the October attack last year, she's like, all of the schools in that region were shut down and a lot of the kids were relocated. And she goes, they didn't get to go to school. And she said, so this summer I volunteered and flew in and stayed on the Sea of Galilee and actually taught the, the kids that were displaced by what was going on through their summer to get them caught back up in school and in their classes. And I was like, how awesome is the Lord that like he returned back to her, her pouring out. You know, like the Lord laid it on our hearts to reach out particularly to that teacher and then to get there and find out that she had been going and giving of her time to love on the Jewish and Arabic people in Israel, I thought was just amazing. And so um, it was so awesome. She's sent me um, over the last day or two, and we'll show them in the future, some videos of the kids like getting to read uh, their books at reading time. And so, yeah. Uh, in total, I think we gave them about 60 books. Yeah. Yeah, and all of them are specifically for kindergarten and first grade reading level. I worked with uh, the teacher to go specifically to a couple of different places that had um, what's like phonetic books for the kids, particularly in that age group. And so it's really, really wonderful. Thank you, that was an awesome question. See, we're a team. We celebrate 18 years this month. It's just awesome. So, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, woo! Um, also, uh, the Lord has opened up an opportunity right up the street here is Riverside. And, um, you know, it's a public high school in our city. And <clears throat> Michael and I had someone reach out to us uh, from Emmanuel Church. 
that they had met with the leadership at Riverside, and they are asking for the churches in this area to start holding prayer meetings on their campus. And so on November 9th, Renew, Emmanuel, and Bethel will be doing a united prayer event that Saturday morning on the campus at Riverside at the request of the leadership of that school because of the issues they're facing this year. They are understaffed and have had major issues among the students this year, unlike years previously. And so I know Bethel has been on and off that campus uh, for a number of years doing different things, but the Lord has opened a door again for us to get back onto that campus. And so we're working together with other churches in our area. That will be the first prayer meeting. We will probably then from there start a rotation between our churches to do additional prayer meetings on that campus. Whether we're in the building or not, we're on the property right? And that is at the request of the leadership of that school. And so please mark your calendars for Saturday, November 9th from 8.30 to 9.30. We'll be doing an hour prayer meeting. We'll all start together, maybe do a worship song, and then just allow everyone to go their separate ways. And I love that uh, when we were sitting down with Pastor Greg at Renew and the pastors at Emmanuel, the pastor at Emmanuel goes, I know our churches might pray a little differently, (laughs) <laughs> and he goes, but it's okay for us all to be there praying at the same time. And I said, I love your heart because I guarantee we probably pray differently. <laughs> but it's awesome to be there praying at the same time, right? Like it's time for our churches to begin to be bold on behalf of the kingdom of God, right? It's time for us to be unashamed. Our city is filled with people who are unashamed. You can't miss it when you drive around Durham. People are unashamed. It's time for the church to be unashamed, right? It's time for us to be an influence in our city, in our state, in our community under the leading of the Lord. And that's what matters to me. I want to be led of the Lord in everything that we do. And that's actually what I'm talking about this morning. You have some base notes in your hand. So I'm talking about alignment with God. Right, and what does that look like? What does alignment with God look like? And so we're going to look at the life of Jesus, and we're going to look at some things that don't matter, and then we're going to look at some things that do matter, right? So we're going to begin in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. I love that Jesus says his food is God's will, right? Jesus is like, I feed on, right? In my spirit, in my soul, I feed on the will of the Father. And I think it's so important for us as believers to set our hearts, to set our sustenance after the things that Jesus set his heart after. And that is the will of the Lord. Because there's a lot of things going on right now in our nation. There's a lot of things going on right now in churches that are not the will of the Lord. They're not. There are so many churches in this day and hour and so many groups in this day and hour that are caught up with things that I don't actually believe are the heart of the Lord. And so we're going to look at four things that it's not about, and then we're going to look at what it is about right? Four things it's not about. Because I think Jesus showed us regularly what it's not about. And I think we have to set him as the model, right? We're looking to be Christ-like Christians, right? So when we're doing things, we're called to do them the way that Jesus did. I think number one, we see it's not about an audience, right? Jesus was never overly concerned with numbers, Right? Do you know that even now the Father isn't overly concerned with numbers? What does he say? Wide is the road, and many are those who path like travel that path. Narrow is the gate, and few are those that find it. Right? The Lord isn't caught up in it being about an audience. He's not caught up in it being about numbers. It's about relationship. It's always been about relationship with the Father. Right? The Lord has always made it about relationship. And I love that we see even in Jesus' life, he makes it about that relationship with the Father. Right, Luke chapter 5, we see that Jesus has been with a crowd. Right, news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and be healed of their sicknesses. 
But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Do you know in Scripture, you never see Jesus leaving a few. You never see Jesus leaving prayer to go be with mass numbers. But you regularly see Jesus leaving mass numbers to go and be away with the Lord in prayer, to go and be away with the Father in prayer, to go and be with fewer. You ever notice that? Jesus never leaves a Zacchaeus to go to a crowd, but he often leaves a crowd to go to a Zacchaeus. He never leaves a, a Lazarus to go to a crowd, but he leaves a crowd to go to a Lazarus. Right? Why? Because it's about relationship. It's not about audience. Right? The Lord knows those that are going to be wholly His. The Lord knows those that are going to walk with Him. And so He's willing to spend Himself in a greater way for those than He is the mass numbers. Right? Our society loves to measure about numbers. Right? That's one of the things I've loved about the, the pastor's network that I've become a part of here in our city. Not once has any of those pastors ever asked me what our numbers are at Bethel. I've never asked them what their numbers are because it's not about comparison, right? If Bethel's doing what God wants Bethel to be doing, then Bethel will have the number of people God wants Bethel to have. It's just, that's the simple truth. If we're doing what the Lord wants us to do, then we will grow in the way the Lord wants us to grow in the Lord's time. If we're not, we can pack this place out with people that in the end don't have a relationship with the Lord and don't walk rightly with God and aren't being a kingdom impact. They're just butts and seats. And I'm not worried about just butts and seats. I'm not. I'm not. Yes, my heart is moved at times when I think of what we can do. But in pouring out to Western North Carolina, in helping a, a local public school teacher, those are the things the Lord is speaking to us about doing. And those are the things that we will do boldly and unashamedly because we want to be where the Lord wants us to be. We want to do what the Lord wants us to do. And that leads me to number two. Number two is it's not about people's approval. It's not, it's not about people's approval, right? John chapter 2. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs that he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. Jesus wouldn't entrust himself to them because he, some other manuscripts say he says he knows what's in their heart. He wouldn't entrust himself to people because he knew people, right? I just wish we knew people better, right? Every, every cycle, people entrust themselves to politicians, and somehow they always do the same thing, not the thing they said they were going to do, right? Like, so, but somehow people are always like, no, this one's different, right? And then in the end, what happens? They're human. They're just like all the others. You know what I mean? Or, or this thing here or that thing there. It's not about people's approval. It's about following after the Lord, right? John chapter 5 tells us, how can you believe since you accept glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes only from God? That's a bold statement of Jesus. Jesus is like, listen, you can't do this because you're constantly chasing each other's approval. You're constantly chasing each other's like clap on the back and, and each other's like attaboy and all that kind of thing. And he's like, it's not about any of that. It's about the kingdom. It's about the Lord. It's not about people's approval. Number three, Jesus says it's not about appearance. And this is a difficult one for some people. Right? Because we think, oh, well, as Christians, a person should look this way or should look that way. But I love, even when God sends Samuel, right, to anoint David as king, right? What happens? All these people are prayed by Samuel, and he's like, oh, it's going to be this one. Oh, it's going to be that one. Oh, it's going to be this one. Oh, it's going to be that one. And what, is, what does God say to Samuel? Stop judging by outward appearance. Judge by the heart. And we see a similar thing, right, in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 23, it says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs. You look beautiful on the outside, but the inside is full of bones and dead and everything unclean. Right? In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Jesus says, listen, you got the outward appearance going, oh, but man, you missed the, you missed the thing that's more important. 
you miss the greater thing, which is the inward, right? As believers, we've got to have the inward set after the Lord. We've got to start with what's in our spirit and soul before we're worried about that outward expression. Listen, eventually in time, you get all of this right, you will change the way you outwardly appear. I've watched over the years as God has touched and impacted people in so many different walks of life. And once the inside starts getting right with God, the outside begins to change. Because it can't also not change when you become Christ-like. But you can't just worry about the outward. You have to worry about the inward. Because the outward, you're leaving behind. Right? You're leaving this world. You're leaving this body behind when you go before the Lord in glory. Listen, I'm not going before the Lord as like a poor visioned bald guy. You know what I mean? Like that's the outward appearance isn't what's going before the Lord. But it's who I am in here. It's my spirit, man. And if I get this right, it will overflow into getting the external, getting the outward right. Amen? Awesome. Number four. Number four, and this one may also be a little bit tough for some people. It's not about actions. And you would think to yourself, well, but, but Pastor Farrell, like, shouldn't we like, you know, do things on behalf of the Lord and, and be faithful? And, and, and doesn't the Bible talk about works? It does talk about all of that. But it talks about that secondarily to relationship. Again, relationship is the priority. Right? Matthew 7, when Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, what does it say? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. The will of the Lord. That's what's important. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. That's, that's wild to think that there are people that are going to go before the Lord in heaven someday and they're going to be ready to list off all of the signs and the wonders and the miracles and all the things that the Lord did through them, right, on this earth while they're there thinking that that's going to be enough. And it's not. It's not enough. Why? Because it's not about the actions. It's not about the actions. I remember years ago, there was a minister had a, a tremendously impactful uh, evangelistic ministry at the time. Tremendously impactful evangelistic ministry at the time. This is 15, 17 years ago. And behind the scenes, I knew someone who had left his ministry because there was major, major sin going on in his personal life. There was major stuff, heartbreaking stuff. Not just in one area, but on multiple fronts. Parallel to that, before it was exposed, I had friends that had people that were a part of their ministry in Kansas City. Their daughter was dying. Doctors could not figure out what was going on. They signed medical paperwork, checked their daughter out of the hospital, drove over 20 hours through the day and night to get their daughter to the meetings this evangelist was holding. When he laid hands on her, she was instantaneously healed. Instantaneously healed and never suffered from sickness again. And within a month, everything that was going on in his personal life was exposed. And I had people that, that came to me and were like, how could God do that? How could God? And I said, God didn't do it because of that guy. God did it because of the faith of that family. Right? God was responding to the, the cry of a father and mother over their daughter. He wasn't responding to what was going on in that guy's life. The Lord met them. God would have met them in that hospital room if they would have believed for God to have come in that hospital room. But in their minds, they believed God was in those evangelistic meetings, so they took their daughter to those meetings to get her touch. Right? In the Old Testament, in the original Testament, God used a donkey. Right? To, so the Lord's open and capable of using anything. Right? In the New Testament, we know God uses pieces of cloth anointed by the Apostle Paul to cast out demons and heal the sick. Right? In and of that piece of cloth, there's no, it holds no power. It's a piece of cloth. No, no, no. It's, it's the response in the kingdom to what God's doing. Right? 
And there are so many people that think because of their actions, right, they've got this laundry list of accolades ready to roll out with the Lord as to all the things they've done for his kingdom, and they don't realize they've gotten caught up in doing for him, not being with him. Years ago, when I was at an unbelievably low point in ministry, I don't even know if my wife remembers this, but we had come home one Sunday after church, and, and I was sitting in this rocker in our bedroom, and I was just weeping because I was like, man, I, I like, my, on the inside, I felt weary. I felt tired. I, I was like, what's going on? And I remember my wife sitting on the bed as I was in that rocker weeping with the Lord. My wife made a statement, and I knew God was speaking through her in that moment. Right? I, I'd been in the full-time ministry you know, for like 15, 17 years at that point. Like all these things that I've traveled the world, done all this stuff on behalf of the Lord. And I was sitting there so dry. And I was weeping. And my wife said, you've made a great employee, but I miss you as a son. And I knew in that moment what the Lord was saying. You've done all the stuff, but where's the relationship? right? Because I had come out of the place where I spent time with the Lord in prayer. I had come out of the place where I spent time in worship for the purpose of just hanging out with the Father. I had come to the place where I did it all for the sake of ministry. It was all about what I was pouring out, what I was doing. It wasn't about who I was with. And I had taken my alignment away from the, the Lord, and I had a, a kind of turned it into the church. And I went away for a couple of days to a, a cabin at a state park and I just took my Bible and, and a journal and, and one or two books, and I just went away, and I sat on the front porch of that cabin, and I just wept with the Lord for days. I just walked in the woods and prayed in the Spirit and sat on the porch and wept as I was like realigning my heart with the Lord. And I come back from that trip, and the Lord's like, go back to school. And I was like, God, I don't want to go to school in my 40s, Jesus. Like, that sounds like a terrible idea. I remember when I did finally start doing classes, the first class that I did going back to school again, the professor wrote me and said, your content's great. Your grammar is terrible. I was so offended. I was like, do you know what I did? I was like, all this stuff, you know, and Sharon was like, babe, the Lord's trying to humble you right now. And I was like, shh. But as I went through that, and started back into school, I saw the hand of the Lord leading and guiding and moving and directing. Because at the end of the day, church family, it's not about pleasing everyone. It's not. Do you know in Jesus doing the will of the Father, Jesus didn't please everyone? Do you know Jesus didn't please everyone, right? At one time, his own family thought he was crazy, right? In Mark chapter 3, his family, his family, family thought he was crazy, right, out of his mind, right? People from his hometown where he grew up tried to kill him because they thought he was wrong for doing what he was doing. So at one point, his own family didn't like him. At one point, his own hometown turned on him. Then we see in Matthew 12 that the religious leaders accuse him of doing what he's doing under the power of demons, so at one point, his family didn't believe in him. At one point, his hometown didn't believe in him. At another point, religious leaders didn't believe in him. Because they said he was demonized. At another point, his followers left. Because they said, what you're saying is too hard for us. Your teaching's too difficult. Can you imagine if you had it in your heart to be all about people and to be all about the world and to be all about these things? Man, the moment the audience left, the moment approval left, the moment all these things started leaving, your heart would be in a mad panic that you missed it. But his heart wasn't. Why? Because he was aligned with doing the will of the Father. He wasn't aligned with doing what his family necessarily and solely wanted, or he would have done that and missed the will of his father. He wasn't aligned with people that he had grown up with in his hometown, or he would have missed the will of his father. He wasn't aligned with necessarily people in the church and in the religious system, or he would have missed the will of the father. He wasn't even aligned with those who followed his teaching that praised him for doing this sermon great or, or that teaching wonderfully or whatever, because when they all started to leave, he would have changed the way he preached. Right? All of that would have changed about the Lord if he cared about those things. But because he'd set himself on one thing, right? He'd set himself on one thing, and there's one thing we have to set ourselves on. It's about alignment with God. It's about aligning ourselves with the Lord, right? 
And, and understanding that this is what God's called us to. You see, in John chapter 6, it says in verse 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. I've come not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. You know, years ago, Sharon and I, when, when Finley was really little, um, she was probably like maybe five, six months old at the time. We had this little 1,000 square foot, 1,100 square foot brick uh, block house that we lived in. It was just quaint. It was sweet. We enjoyed it for what it was. And the owner of the home reached out to us and said, um, we want to gift this home to our daughter when she gets married, so we're asking you guys to move out. And we were like, oh, okay. So we started looking for other places to move into and couldn't find a place. Like We just couldn't find a place for the budget that we had. And we were like, man, Lord, what do we do? What do we do? And one, one day, I'm in my office, and I'm talking to the Lord, and I'm like, Lord, where do we go? Lord, what do we do? And the Lord speaks to me about this family in our church. They had a, a moderately large home, and the Lord says, call them and ask if you can move into their spare bedroom. And I was like, Jesus, please. <laughs> I was like, we're the associate pastors of this a large ministry, big public school or big you know, private school. We've got all like, there's got to be a house somewhere. There's got to be a place somewhere. And I was like, I don't want to move into someone's spare bedroom with my wife and infant. But I just couldn't shake it. I couldn't shake the Lord as I call and ask if you can move in. I called Sharon and I go, hey, I don't know how you feel about this, but I feel like God might want us to move in with this family and live in their spare bedroom. But I haven't asked them if it's okay, you know. And Sharon says, yeah, I think I could do that. And I was like, okay, well, great. You know, she's so much more spiritual than I am, church family. You know that. And I was like, okay, Lord, you know. And so I called. That afternoon, I called that family. You've met them, Doug and Mercy. They were here for our installation service. I called them and I said, um, I said to Mercy, can we meet with you on Sunday? I'd like to talk with you about something. And Mercy goes, yeah, we can meet with you on Sunday. And at this point, Sharon and I hadn't made it known that we'd been asked to move out of our house. We hadn't made it known because the people that owned that home were a part of our church. And so we were just like, Lord, we don't want to make a big deal out of it. They're gifting it to their daughter. We trust you. And so I said to, to Mercy on the phone, can we meet on Sunday? And she said, yeah, we can meet on Sunday. And she goes, but I just need to tell you, if you're going to ask to live with us, the answer is Yes. And I go, well, <laughs> and I go, why did, you, why did you say that? I go, why did you say that? And she goes, because this morning when Doug and I were in prayer together, we felt the Lord speak to us that you guys were going to need a place to stay, and God wanted us to open our home. We moved in with them thinking we were going to be there like four or five weeks as we searched for a house. We lived with them 11 months. 11 months we lived in their home. But because Doug does finance for a living in that 11 months, he got my wife and I absolutely and totally debt-free in our lives. Helped us eliminate all of the debt that we had in our lives. And I remember there were numerous times we tried to move out. We tried. So many times we tried to move out. Sharon would even like send faxes to like, uh, you know, the people that like decide whether you're going to, huh? Huh? Yeah, she would try to fax applications to places and would be on the phone with the person. They would go, I'm sorry, the fax isn't coming through. And Sharon's like, but I put the number in. Like, I just sent it. And they'd be like, it's not here. You know, it was like, God was like, block, 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 block. All these times. <laughs> if you didn't hear her, she just said she hated it. There were lots of tears that were shed in the bathroom between the two of us as we were like, God, what are you doing? And our church did a 21-day fast to start every year. And that January, during our 21-day fast, the Lord spoke to me on like day three, day four of the fast, and said, on day 19 of the fast, you can call this real estate agent and give them from this street to this street and from this street to this street in Jacksonville, and that's where I want you to be. And I said, Lord, that's such a small area. And I have to wait like, 13, 14 days to make that phone call? This seems crazy. But I waited. And on day 19, I called that person. And I said, we're looking for a house. Here's the section of town God said we could live. And she goes, I'll, I'll never find anything there for what you can pay. I said, that's what the Lord told us. 
She called us back a couple hours later, and she said, there's one place. And I said, well, good, I only need one house. <laughs> she said, would you and your wife like to see it? It's a townhouse. I said, yes, we would love to. We went, walked through the front door, and we just knew it was the place for us. We knew this is where the Lord had us to go next. As we were standing in that house, the real estate agent gets a phone call, and it's the owner of the home who lived out of state. The owner of the home had multiple houses, different places. God, I really blessed him. And he said, I'm in town. I heard you're giving the renters a tour. I'd like to come and meet them. She said, would you guys like to meet the homeowner? We said, sure. So we wait a few minutes. It's not long. The door opens, and this guy comes in, and he walks right up to me, and he goes, I heard you're a preacher. <laughs> I, I said, you never know. Listen, you never know with people. That could win them over. That could repel them. Amen? Right? Like... There have been some different people in town that are like, I heard you're over there at Bethel. And I'm like, yep. <laughs> right? I don't know what's next. So I said, I am. And he said, are you over at this church over here? New life. And I said, I am. And he holds his arms out like this. And he goes, welcome to my home. I am a Jew. And I know you love the Jewish people. And he like comes up and like wraps his arms around me. and gives me this big hug. And I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. You're so good. <laughs> We ended up living there over the next couple of years, and as we did, he came to multiple different events at our church with Sharon to sit at seders and, and different things, and we developed such a wonderful relationship with him as our landlord, and it was all because even though it was difficult for us, even though we struggled, we had said to the Lord, Lord, we just want to do what you want us to do. We're trying to align ourselves with your plan and purpose, and although it's stretched and although it's difficult, we know you always have our best in mind. The Lord always has your best in mind. We were blessed with a family photo shoot yesterday, and the lady that was taking our picture started sharing life with us. And, and Sharon and I started, you know, talking with her because she knew we were ministers. And she started saying, my husband and I, want to, you know, we want to move out of our house, but we just feel like God's saying no right now, but, but we really want to move out. And I said, listen, if you feel like God's saying no, obey God. Obey God, because anything you do that goes against that, it's going to take you out of alignment with the Lord. It's going to take you out of the will of God. And church family, there's no greater place to be than in the will of God. There's no greater place to be than in alignment with God. And in being in alignment with God, it may mean a job change. It may mean a shifting it, you know, situation with a family dynamic. It may mean that at times you have to speak up when you would rather you know, hold back. Or it may mean that you have to go places and do things that are stretching for you. But if you're in alignment with the Lord, I guarantee you, you will see the hand of God you'll see the hand of God, right? Matthew makes it really clear. Seek first his kingdom, and he'll add all these things unto you. All of those things are the things we need in everyday life, but the, when the Lord adds them unto us, it's not when we ask for them. He adds them unto us when we're putting his kingdom first, when we're in alignment with him. And I love that Paul, even writing to the church in Corinth, Right, Paul's like writing, and, and in chapter two he says to them, listen, when I came to be with you, I said it on one thing. I said it all on one thing. Let's look at that. First Corinthians chapter two. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came in weakness and with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Paul says to the entire church at Corinth, I don't want you leaning on me. I want you leaning on Jesus. When I came and shared with you, I put everything else aside and I made it all about Jesus. So when I left, you would still have a firm foundation. In our human nature, we love to make it about so many other things. 
right? We love to make it like, that's why you have certain ministers that have massive followings, right? In society and in culture, right? You have certain ministers that like, they're the most popular on Instagram or Facebook or podcasting or all these different things. Why? Because people love to follow people. They love to put people up on a pedestal. They love to, you know, make people what it's all about. But you know what happens when you do that? When that leader then stumbles or struggles, all of a sudden people get rippled and shaken because they've made it about one another. But when you make it all about the Lord, you are on a foundation that can never be shaken. You're on a foundation that can never be shaken because you're not following human voices. You're not following particular leaders. You're following the truth of the living God. You've set your foundation on his word. And that's what we are called to do. We're called to set ourselves on the word, on the truth of God. We're called to align ourselves with the Lord. And it's not easy. At times, it may have a great level of demand on you. At times, the Lord may ask you to do unbelievably unique or weird things. But I promise, when you're obedient, God shows up and does wildly. Because the Lord is looking. He's longing for people that will align themselves with Him, day and night day and night. For some of you, that alignment with the Lord may come in your prayer life. It may come in the night watch, right? It may come in the day when the Lord's calling you to, to get away and seek his face over something or pray in the spirit over certain things. And in the end, you might not know exactly even what you're praying about, but you're trusting the Lord to be speaking through you. For others of you, it may be more evangelistic, the Lord's calling you to go somewhere and minister to someone or, or to go somewhere and bless someone. For others of you, it may be in areas of, of acts of servanthood or things like that where the Lord's asking you to go and take care of something for somebody, not even knowing or understanding in the end what that even means, but you're just being faithful and obedient. And in being faithful and obedient, you're leaving it all to the Lord because you're aligning yourself with God and his plan and his purpose. Matt, can I get you to make your way back up? We must set ourselves after him. I genuinely believe in my heart, over the next few months, things are going to get crazier and crazier in our culture and society and nation and the nations of the world, right? I think the earth is literally groaning, like it talks about in Romans, for the revelation of the sons and daughters of God. I think the earth is longing for us to step up and do what God's called us to do. And in the midst of that, I think we will see chaos and strife and difficulty in the lives of those that don't know the Lord. But for those of us that do, we don't fear the same things they fear, right? We're not troubled the way that they're troubled. We've set ourselves in alignment with God. We've put our hearts after him. And in doing that, we've made it all about the Lord and what the Lord longs to do. And so we have decide then in our lives, we're going to do what God wants us to do. Right? Colossians 3. It's our last verse for today. But Colossians 3 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord you're serving. Whatever you do, work at it as if it's for the Lord. Align yourself as if it's for the Lord. Right? Seek first his kingdom. And he'll add all of these things unto you. The Lord has called us to be faithful. And in the midst of a society and a nation that doesn't understand faithfulness, we should shine. I love, I, the last few days my family went camping together. And it's, I'm just going to say it's been a long time since we've camped. 
The last time we camped wasn't overly successful. We actually called it early and went home because camping in Florida is not the same as camping in North Carolina, right? <laughs> there weren't mosquitoes large enough to carry away my children. <laughs> but we were out on Friday night. We had made a fire and cooked you know, s'mores over it, and the fire had died down. And my parents were there. They wanted to come up and camp with us. And me and the girls, Sharon and Oliver would come and go back and forth. Because um, we just, Oliver's not ready to tent camp yet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, <laughs> but Sharon had left and gone back to the house. And we're all sitting. And I can't remember if it was my mom or Finley that looked up and go, wow, look at the stars. Right? And when you're like out in the forest... There's nothing that, that kind of gets in the way on a clear night of seeing the stars in the sky. And we like all just kind of looked up as the moon was coming up over the trees. And you could just see so many stars. And they were standing out like so bright and so beautiful. And we were all like, oh my gosh, it's so awesome, you know. And the girls were like, there's so many stars, you know. Like, because <laughs> when you live in a city, you don't see the stars. We were just like looking at the stars and I was like, man, Lord, how awesome that you've called us to be like that, right? The Lord's called us to shine like the stars, right? That on a clear view night, nothing can block the brightness of a star that may be millions of miles away, but you can see it as if you could reach up and take hold of it out of the sky. That's how the Lord wants us to be to a dark, dark world. When we're aligned with him, we shine. When we're following his will, when we have him as our firm foundation, when we're being Christ-like, we shine. And the world needs us to shine now more than ever. More than ever, the world needs us to shine. Stand with me. I just want to pray over you this morning. Lord, I thank you for this community. Lord, I thank you for those that are here this morning, for those that are watching online. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to align with the Father, that you would help us to align with Jesus, that you would keep us on the narrow path, that you would show us what you're doing, and at times when we have difficulty and when we struggle, Lord, bring that reassurance, bring that affirmation into our souls, into our mind, will, and emotions that we are doing what you've asked us to do. Because, Lord, there are times when we don't see the end from the beginning. There are times when we don't know how it's going to go. There are times, Lord, when we feel you speaking or saying something, and we're like, I don't understand why. Lord, I had no idea why you led me to that teacher until I was in conversation with her, and then it was clear. Lord, there are so many times we don't know why, but we feel you leading, we feel you calling, we feel you pulling, and so help us, Holy Spirit, to obey. Help us to be bold and to pursue you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Help us, like the Apostle Paul, to know nothing but you, so that when we need to know you most, we know you most. When others need an answer, we can point them to the answers that matter. So help us, Lord, to align ourselves with you so that we can help others see you for who you are, the author and the finisher, their great salvation, the answer their hearts are longing for. We thank you for today, Lord, in your presence in this place. Be with us as we go forth from here. Lord, use us this week to be an impact in this community, in this state, and unto the uttermost ends of the earth in our prayers. We love you.